Okay, I'm going to um, quickly introduce Linda Caldwell. Linda Caldwell owns a farm on Paint Lick Creek, where her ancestors have lived for many generations. She was a librarian in a community and, a, and a community volunteer at Friends of Paint Lick. Finishing Line Press, Press published her first book of poems, Home Place, in 2016. Linda's poetry honors this place and her people. So, well. This is the book, and I'm going to read some from the book at some other points that relate to the theme of the book, which is about home place, my farm and house in Kentucky. This is not my house, <laughs> <laughs> but it belonged in the family, the relatives, the, the property, and uh, I loved this picture that a friend took, so I had to have it for my book. First poem I'll read is about writing poems, sort of about writing poems. Um, it's called In the Churchyard. The car shivers with wind's assault. I feel Earth's revolution under leafless Trees, grass waves like Kansas wheat mimicking oceans. Can you hear me? <laughs> December warm enough to put the top down. I spin in brightness. I cling, tilt, turn, wait. Grow no wiser through the passing seasons. Still, I write poems. This particular December was sort of like the December we've had this year. Most of these poems have been written over a 20-year period, so it, I got, it took a long time getting them published, but finally I have a book in hand. Uh, this is called Artif Artifacts, um, and this was a march, much like last week, <laughs> took place in March. And uh, after having a room torn off my house when they remodeled, I found lots of relics and uh, bits of china and glass and uh, other things. And then in our part of the country here, we have lots of arrowheads in the fields after they're plowed in the spring find a lot of arrowheads left by the Native Americans that were here in uh, actually I guess prehistory these particular arrowheads artifacts while clouds gather against the mountains march unleashed howls around the eaves objects blow and wash a pocket from a rotted jacket flaps beside the garden gate. From the underworld, a forgotten red eye blinks. Flecks of window glass and flow blue china dot my path. Arrowheads prick fresh smelling plowed bottomlands. Only Leo, far above, watches as I stalk treasures no one knows but me and those who left them behind. Also, when I did some remodeling on my house, uh, took down 13 layers of wallpaper. <laughs> the only thing that was holding the plaster on the wall, I think, was the wallpaper. <laughs> and my sister-in-law made me a, a picture, uh, framed a picture of the wallpaper and the poem, this poem for me, wallpaper. I strip my mother's hand-painted dog with blossoms away from pale memory of green and white lattice work. Deeper in the friable underlayers peel back like sunburnt skin. When I'm down to turquoise, brown, and one swirl of red, I know the last eyes that saw these patterns belong to the dead. Few words outlived them, spidery lines in a Bible on old deeds, and almost dust, 
ghost's glimmer whisper as my fingers separate paper from paste held together for 130 years. I write a lot about ghosts, but uh, it's not like Casper or, or you know, they, they don't materialize in front of me, but they, I feel a, people that have lived around me, I still feel them there. This one's called Unmended Wall, and Barbara, my cousin, is here. And you can tell Carol about this one, this experience I had with my cousin, Carol. Uh, we decided to move some rocks from an old rock wall to her farm, or her house in her yard. She wanted something from her grandparents' farm. So uh, it was sort of an ordeal. She ended up having knee surgery shortly after uh, <laughs> doing this. Oh dear. A mended wall. Cheeks like soapstone crumble between a few upright rocks that do not resemble limestone found elsewhere on the farm. Fragile and yellow, we named them slate. I feel no kin in this line fence, although the stone workers of New Grange and Boulevard rattle in my bones. Slave walls, they were called, but built by Scots and Irish. Boundaries born in their heads and planted in Kentucky. Bending and lifting, we work, knees pop, and fingers bleed. This wall's future is its past. And I, if uh, you don't know what New Grange and Pool of Brown are, uh, their uh, boulder up Pool de Brown is a burial site in uh, Ireland, and New Grange is a place underground, similar to Stonehenge, except the light shows in midwinter instead of mid midsummer on the, the heel stone. This poem is in two parts. One is a dream or a fantasy, and part two is a memory. Part one, tea. When I swirl hot water to warm the brown Betty, the odor of the potteries rises, another time in Belique or Bybee. An old ache settles in my back, and, my, and the arch of my foot flattens under another's weight and toll, toil. High tea with a boiled egg is luxury. Part two, clay. Clay in the vat is smoothed back and forth with the hoe. My father and uncle dig and plaster. Heavy horses cart earth from under timbers that hold the house aloft. This house, I stand in now, staring into the bottom of the pot. In, I think it was 1947 that they put a basement in my house and they took the horses under, under the house to, with scoops to scoop out the dirt to make the basement. That's a, a mem one of my first memories of some of those big horses coming out from under the house. <laughs> my father was a tobacco farmer, and uh, tobacco farming has changed a lot since he passed away. And I call this after the first cut. When the tobacco wagons rattle planks and slow down on the curb, they draw both my ear and eye. Brown men plant their feet on poplar rails. Spanish and English mix orders and conversation echoes to my father's lost words. Dying plants droop westward in opposition to your face turned toward resurrection morning. The footprint, the footprint of your barn remains for once you handed off sticks heavy with plants that threw shadow over me. The past swallows tomorrow. You have been gone longer than I had you. This is another one about uh, differences in farming. Part one is about a young farmer. 
part two is about my father. Generations of Farmers, one. Within the dormant winter woods, a patch of white traps the eyes. Nestled in the crotch of a fallen tree, a newborn lies like drifted snow. Perhaps his mother hid him out, as cows often do. Cloud shadows float over pure Charolais. Did his ears flap, or did the wind lift and drop them? Whisper a name. One deep eye opens. I won't count his bones among my broken, lost, midst blind stone scatter. Tell the young farmer his new calf rests near the landmark, spalted oak. Part two. The ghost of my father stirs. A film of memory on the coldest day of the year. A dry Guernsey does not follow the milkers in at dusk. The old her herdsman searches the naked woods and sinkholes where cows tend to hide when giving birth until he finds her and her newborn in a pawpaw thicket. He shoulders the calf to our heart. If the mother won't nurse, he and my mother will feed him formula from a bottle, keep him near until his gawky legs lift him. This is a poem about a farmer that just passed away last month and his mother. Only I changed it around a little bit. Rituals. Within a bare bolt circle of light, he skins the dead calf and places its hide over the orphan. Under the smell of blood, milk, and last year's tobacco, his wife halters the splay-legged mother. Squirting milk on the baby's head, he anoints. The woman hums. They hope the cow will smell her own scent, her baby's skin, and allow nursing. But after dodging heels and head, they give up, feed the orphan from a bottle and bucket. Months later, a Charolais bull, like a puppy, follows them along the fence row. <laughs> the wife's perfect toes are bruised sacrifice to patient, patience and rough affection. <laughs> I have to give my mother her due. I'll read one about her. She was a very special pe person. She read to me and my brother. She wrote poetry but that I never got to read because, I don't know, she just didn't let me. <laughs> so she inspired me to write. In my mother's kitchen, I thought painting over her tulip yellow walls with a skimmed milk blue would banish her. She despised blue. But I forgot the old kitchen where I now sleep was bead and batten covered with grandmother's buttermilk blue. Mother didn't flee the hated hue. She made a new kitchen. Under her hands moved from the 40s to the 70s like lard to canola. I gave up the struggle to exile her, kept her metal base sink, second hand for my, second hand for my table, rustic cabinets that my uncle built, and her teapots. In other rooms, ghosts departed when I moved their chairs. But my mother comes into the kitchen pulls up a stool and asks for a cup of tea with milk. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll stop here and ask if you have questions. What finally moved you to um, have these poems published after so many years? Well, I I've sent a lot of poems out to magazines and published in magazines and journals. And I put a collection together, put a, a whole book collection together and sent it out a couple of times. Got good comments, but still rejections. <laughs> and uh, it's published by Finishing Line Press, which is here in Kentucky. And they had a contest for, I think it was the Women writers, con Women's Writers Contest, New Voices. And uh, so I sent my $25 off. Didn't win the contest, but they asked to publish the book. So I was delighted. And I had mixed, have a mixed feeling about it, but it, it's turned out, it's turned out okay. 
and they did a beautiful they did a beautiful job on the book. I'm really really happy with the format of the book. Could you say a little bit more about your father as a farmer and did he see changes during his farming time or were those changes the ones that came later? Uh, came later. He died in '74. Retired a couple of years before, and uh, so it was sustainable while he was uh -huh. mm -hmm. Barbara, you might want to tell them that this is also when you say home place. This was the place of our grandparents, and you know, it, it goes back to yes. It, this this is it has been in the family. The house is gone now, uh, but when I. Almost all of Paint Lick is engine in our family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, great -grand our great grandfather owned a lot of property and it sort of went to his children. And so we had family all around and growing up. And uh, so now that's changing. But when is it? Pardon? You are it. I'm the last one. She's the last one. Uh -huh. We've all moved away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lick is rising though, from the ashes. <laughs> There's a wonderful uh, business there called Copperhead. 